In this video, I'll be reviewing limits of sequences of random variables as well as well-established upper bounds on these random variables, um, on these probabilities rather, that allow us to study these limits. While you might be wondering why we should even bother with these limit theorems, here's the big picture. Our ultimate goal is to marry our intuition with the math. So for instance, you have a dice roll um, and you're wondering that you'll get these different values each time, each time you roll a dice. But eventually you figure if you roll the dice enough times, these values will come up equally likely with probability 1 sixth. But now we want to make it so that the expectation of a dice roll um, is such that uh, we get one six. So if we run this trial millions and millions of times, we should be expecting one sixth from our math. We'll see how that's the case. The second point of this big picture is we want to be able to do this analysis um, with knowing only three things. because we sometimes don't have access to the entire um, distribution. A, we need to know that the RV uh, xi, so the sequence is x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, the random variables xi are all iid. Remember what iid was independent in that um, the manifestation of one random variable doesn't tell you any information about the other, and identically distributed. Um, so basically, they come from the same distribution, come from same place, roughly speaking. So the second thing you need to know is the mean of xi, which is mu, and the variance is the third thing which is sigma squared. And since all of these random variables come from the same place, they better have the same mu and sigma squared. And you can, in fact, view the mean and variance as metadata of your RV. They abstract away some of the details of the distribution and give you um, really nice numbers to work with. And notice that we didn't mention distribution at, at all for the three things you know. That's the whole point. Um, sometimes these distributions are hard to um, calculate, and sometimes you just don't even know what these distributions are, which leads us to the third point. In real-world applications, you may get data from a process you do not fully understand, such as translating a sentence. So um, you may not know all the rules, that go into translating a sentence from English to Spanish, uh, for instance. But you have tons and tons of books, right, that um, are translated from English to Spanish. So you, with the right measurements, you can use this data to get trends um, from the data such that you can predict uh, a sentence me gusta and how this will um, translate into English. I like it. Something like that. So, um, and this is all done without knowing what the rules are that specifically translate English to Spanish. We can make very accurate predictions without knowing how anything works at all. So, in general, these theorems are a big deal in probability and statistical inference. All right, convinced? Let's start with the upper bounds we need to study the limits. Markov's inequality. The basic idea is that your mean, uh, mean of RV, should give you a good clue of the values you take. Uh, so if you're expected to be smaller than a certain value, then you're 
not very likely to be larger than that value. So mathematically, you have the probability of a random variable being greater than or equal to alpha is less than or equal to the mean of this random variable over alpha for all alpha greater than or equal to zero. And you can see how this intuition holds because if A is huge, then this um, fraction goes to zero. And so the probability of um, this random variable being larger is not very likely. Cool. So remember the definition of expectation. Uh, your expectation is the sum of all values it takes. Um, the value it takes times the probability that x takes that value. Now we're only interested in this alpha that will be big, so let's just chop off some values of this sum. So we can chop off the values to get the sum of all the a that's greater than or equal to alpha of a times probability of x minus uh, x equals um, a. And notice that we make an assumption that x uh, is non-zero, right? So x is non-negative, sorry, negative. Because if x were negative, then chopping off some values will not necessarily make this expectation larger, right? So that's why we need this assumption that x takes on positive or zero values. Good, so um, now that we have this taken care of, we can see that um, we can replace these values that are larger than alpha with just alpha itself and keep this uh, sum smaller than the expectation. And since alpha doesn't really depend on A, you can just take this out of the summation. And this becomes um, a sum of disjoint events because X can only take one value at a time. So this is just the same as the probability that x is greater than alpha. And this is how we derive Markov's inequality. All right, so um, good. Now why is this useful? It turns out that Markov's inequality is actually very weak, so what's the big deal? Well, think about a setting, right? A setting where your mean value, uh, where you have a mean value of something, and you want to see if you stray away from that, if you become much greater than that. So much greater than mean. Um, and also think back to our original problem formulation. What do we know? Well, the natural candidate for this setting is, in fact, um, deviation from the mean. And we usually measure this by x minus mu squared. So remember Markov's inequality where we have um, this formula here. Now let's rename this to a different constant k squared. Uh, probability that x minus mu squared is less uh, greater than or equal to k squared is less than or equal to the expectation of this um, deviation from the mean over k squared. And you notice that this term is actually just the variance of x. Amazing. And variance is something we already know from the big picture talk I just gave. And if you take the square root of both sides here, you end up with x minus mu greater than or equal to k is less than or equal to variance of x over k squared. And this is Chebyshev's inequality. Amazing. So Chebyshev's inequality directly follows from um, Markov's inequality. And all you just have to do is do the math. So note that Chebyshev's inequality is two-sided. It doesn't matter which side um, you're away from the mean. So suppose this is the mean. Then as long as you're a certain distance uh, k, right? So this part is k, and this part is also k. Um, then it calculates this probability here. So that's how Chebyshev's is two-sided. And it's an upper bound, right? Upper bound. Cool. 
So uh, now we can return to our original problem of studying a sequence of random variables. Let's formalize this problem a little bit. All right, first you have a sequence of iid random variables x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, known collectively as xi. So um, let s of n be the sum of these random variables. And this n is a parameter for this sum because we're going to adjust n a little. So n is a parameter. We will adjust. And remember that each of the xi come from the same distribution. So we know its mean and we know its variance. So now if we wanted to calculate the mean of this sn, it'll just be the sum of all the xi. And this is, since there are n of these, uh, you have n times mu. And similarly for variance, um, since these are independent, it's just the sum of the variances. Uh, variances of xi, sorry, this should be the mean. Um, and this will be n sigma squared. Now, this isn't very useful at all, because when n gets large, your e is going to blow up, and your variance, so, and your variance is going to be all over the place, literally. Now, there are two ways to handle it. So the first way is to use the sample mean. So basically, all that entails is um, we divide this sum we get a new random variable by dividing the sum by n. So this is 1 over n times the sum of the xi. And now we can recalculate the expectation of this. And remember that 1 over n is just a constant. So uh, you can pull this constant out. And this will just be 1 over n times n mu is just mu. Now for the variance of this sample mean, uh, remember, when you pull a constant out of the variance, it becomes squared. So you have 1 over n squared times n sigma squared, and this is just sigma squared over n. Cool. So now you just need to plug in a n into Chebyshev's inequality. And this means that the probability that a n deviates from its mean for a certain distance is less than the variance of this um, random variable divided by the distance squared. And we already calculated this variance of a n to be sigma squared over n. So then this right hand side just becomes sigma squared over n alpha squared. And if we let n go to infinity, just as um, which represents our way of taking millions and millions of samples of this random variable up, up to an infinite amount, then this, um, uh, this probability that these um, variables will deviate um, from the mean will go to zero, which means essentially that a n converges to um, the, the mean with, with probability. And this is the weak law of large numbers. And for CS70, this is all you need to concern yourself with. And this is what we've been naturally thinking along, that if you take enough samples and average them, you'll get the true expectation. The expectation is just the limiting case of our sample mean. So sample mean. So with probability, it converges to the actual mean. That's right. And we only used our first principles, our basic definitions, to derive this fact. Magnifique, profound. So that's all you can analyze just by taking the sample mean instead of just the sum of the random variables. So method two is to keep the variance constant. So remember how we made the variance 0 here. Uh, we can keep the variance constant to get a different analysis, but this will be continued. Please watch the next episode for more.